Hi guys, uh, I just want to let you know that this is my last video in the series and I've had an amazing time doing this because I've learned so much along the way um, with who, all of you guys who have been watching. Now, um, what I want to talk about today is very close to me because I, li I actually lived through this time and affected my family directly. Um, so today I want to talk about the LA riots and the effects that it had on the Korean community in LA. Now, on March 3rd, 1991, four LAPD officers arrested a man by the name of Rodney King after a high-speed chase in Southern California. Now, this incident was filmed by a local resident with a video camera, and it showed several white officers beating King, who was black. Now, they were using their batons and kicking him as, they lay on, as he lay on the ground, and it was viewed by millions and millions of people around the world. Cut to April 29th, 1992, a little more than one year later a predominantly white jury in Ventura County acquitted those four police officers of using excessive force in the beating of Rodney King. The non-guilty verdict stunned, angered, and enraged many residents, which led to the nearly week-long widespread riot that killed more than 50 people, injured more than 1,000 people, and caused approximately one billion in damage, about half of which was sustained by Korean-owned businesses. Now, the culture clash between immigrant Korean business owners and predominantly African-American customers exploded over this much publicized acquittals. Now, here's why. On March 16th, 1991, just 13 days after the brutal beating of Rodney King was filmed and aired, 15-year-old Latasha Harlins was fatally shot inside a Korean-owned liquor store. Now, the shooter was the liquor store owner, Soon Ja Du who accused the girl of trying to steal a bottle of orange juice. And there was an altercation. They got into a fight. And the owner who claimed self-defense was found not guilty of voluntary manslaughter, but received no jail time. Instead, she was ordered to serve five years probation, perform 400 hours community service, and pay a $500 fine. Now, the shooting and the verdict completely stressed the relationship between the Black and the Korean communities. But unlike the brutal beating of King that would dominate national and international news, the teenager's death received little media attention in the months that followed. Now, at the time of the riots, many businesses in low-income majority Black neighborhoods like South Central LA were pre predominantly owned by Korean immigrants who were able to purchase them for a low price from white owners who were leaving the neighborhood. Now, that incident, along with the acquittal of the officers who beat Rodney King, were the main factors that contributed to the riots on April 29, 1992. In all, over 300 businesses were burned and looted. Many uninsured businesses never reopened, uprooting the lives of Korean American families who had labored for years to build their livelihoods from scratch. My parents are Korean immigrants. We had a store in South Central LA. We were one of the 300 businesses that were looted and set on fire. But because of the compassion and the bravery of our neighbors, that fire that was set inside of our store was put out and extinguished. Now, in memory of the losses suffered in 1992, Korean Americans call the unrest Sai Yi Gu, or in Korean, 429. That's April 29th. It is remembered by many Korean Americans as an awakening to their minority status a time that they felt abandoned by the government and unfairly portrayed in the media as aggressors despite inadequate law enforcement protection. The Rodney King verdict and the ensuing riots are often framed as a turning point for law enforcement and the African American community, but it's also the single most significant modern event for Korean Americans. Edward Taehan Chang, a professor of ethnic studies and Korean American studies at the University of California Riverside said, despite the fact that Korean American merchants were victimized, no one in the mainstream cared because of our lack of visibility and political power. Now, Chang goes on to say, Korean immigrants, many who arrived in the late 1970s and early 80s, learned that economic success alone will not guarantee their place in America. Many Koreans felt as though that they were secondary citizens and suffered due to a lack of political voice and power. The LAPD left the Korean community to burn for that week. A woman by the name of Elaine Kim wrote an essay for Newsweek magazine at that time, which she states, media played a major role in exacerbating the damage and ill will towards Korean Americans. First, by spotlighting the tensions between the African American and the Koreans above all efforts to work together. And second, by exploiting racist stereotypes of Koreans as unfathomable aliens, this time wielding guns on top of rooftops and allegedly firing wildly into the crowd. 
Her essay accused the media of using the tensions that existed between the two groups as a way of avoiding the true roots of the riots, which I believe is white supremacy in our government institutions and the system of oppression which they created to pit our minority groups against one another. This then led to keep the two groups ignorant about the other by the lack of appropriate education and the distortion of their experiences. The misrepresentation of the Korean and the African-American relationship led the American public to believe that the roots of the riots were based upon these ethnic tensions. Now, instead of the fact that there was a history of racism within the U.S. itself that contributed to the riots, America never wants to admit its wrongs. Now, the media definitely played a role in determining what information it provides. And one thing that the media did not focus on was the attempts for the two groups to improve their relations. You see, the media did not write of the joint church services and the musical services to promote healing and solidarity. It didn't write about the Korean merchants that made donations to the black community and youth programs, or it didn't write about the black community volunteering to help Korean immigrants study for citizenship exams, and also helping one another clean the streets of LA in the aftermath of the riots. Now, uh, I'm very excited to have a guest with me here today. Uh, he's a first-year master's candidate in Asian American Studies at San Francisco State University of Ethnic Studies, the nation's first and only college dedicated to ethnic studies, and he's an incredibly talented and fellow Broadway performer, Mr. Julian de Guzman. Hey, Marcus. Thanks for Hello. joining me here today. Oh, my absolute uh, pleasure. Cool. Uh, so, okay, let's just jump right into it. Um, so, my first question is, can you just, like, um, just talk about yourself and talk about your, uh, your program and your overall experience about going back to school during the pandemic and learning about Asian American studies while living through racist and civil unrest in real time. Sure. Right. So um, prior to the pandemic, I was actually back in New York City. I had just uh, gotten off the Hello Dolly national tour. Uh, and came back to New York City to pursue theater. Um, I was auditioning. I was actually scheduled for a few callbacks when the Broadway suspension happened. Um, and then as the uh, pandemic, you know, dragged on, I recognized, okay, this might be a while. So therefore, you know, I should use my time in some way, shape or form building mm -hmm. towards something. I don't know what yeah. that is. Yeah. Uh, but I always knew that I, I had larger, deeper questions and curiosities mm -hmm. while I had been performing in the commercial theater industry. Studying anti-Asian violence, for example, and the fact that it's been happening um, all over the country, but especially in the Bay Area and New York City, two urban centers of which I consider my two homes, mm -hmm. is it's, it's learning in the educational sense but it's also emotional labor too, because yeah, having to yeah. work through all of this um, violence and, and bullying and all of these layers that have been compounded for so many years for other communities mm -hmm. and having it affect um, demographics of people who I am much more close, or close in proximity to, mm -hmm. um, it strikes a chord emotionally in ways that learning has not done before. Um, we have, our, our community has sort of been ruptured as an actor mm -hmm. community mm -hmm. and myself geographically, you know, being ruptured from, um, you know, from being in New York City and having to leave uh, is that, that took a big toll um, on my mental health. But mm -hmm. what I do find is like creating and building community and building consciousness and sharing this knowledge um, you know, uh, in community, seeing it as taking the idea of self-care and sort of recalibrating it to community care and root mm -hmm. care of like, what are the sources of all of our problems um, has been a gratifying process of activating a consciousness among mm -hmm. our actor community that yeah. um, was not, not that it wasn't there before, but it's more and better, art, more finely articulated now. My next question is, in relation to the LA riots and the overall scope of society, can you talk about the historic system of oppression and its effects on impoverished minority groups and their proximity to crime and racism? 
I think the best way to approach this question, because it's a very, very complicated layered discussion. Yeah. Um, when we talk about, for example, the Rodney King riots, we talk about it in terms of Black Asian, Black Korean, right? These sort of naturalized ideas of race mm -hmm. and how they were pitted against each other, right? That's the very much what girds our discussion of the Rodney King riots. Mm -hmm. um, race, race relations, as well as um, gender with with the Latasha Harlan's killing, um, all of these elements that build, that frame this discussion. But what isn't really discussed is how these ideas of race, you know, they're not necessarily natural ideas. And if we look at it through a different lens of what's called racial formation theory, which is essentially the idea of race as relation how what is race like how do we formulate the idea of race right because these aren't sort of naturalized ideas this isn't truth that just popped up in our development as a civilization black was a construction asian was a construction to understand those d dimensions is to sort of contextualize, okay, now we can enter this discussion of like, how did all of this economic um, tension build up, this tension between the Korean community and mm -hmm. the black community of South Los Angeles, like why did it build up? And over the last 20th century, the systemic underfunding and disinvestment of of marginalized communities made it such that the way we understand a society is that the individual, the, the individual responsibility is placed first and foremost over the community. So then you saw less and less federal funding go into communities and responsibility toward those communities was placed on the state or the city um, to provide resources and infrastructure and all of those things, education, healthcare, what have you. So then you have a massive disinvestment of, of um, all of these resources, which should be made available to peoples and they're taken away. And all of a sudden you have entire populations of people who are left to fend for themselves. So right. you have Korean merchants who are brought here as a result, as a direct result of empire of the United States military um, and, and business interests in, in South Korea creating this flow of migration and only allowing them to settle in proximity to other racialized communities right. without providing any resources or material support. That's right. only breeding the conditions for, for them to ignite up in flame. So first right. it was Latasha Harlins being shot by Soon Ja Du, and then it was the Rodney King beating. And yeah. that's what set off this tension and yeah. built the narrative, which was prop, which was, propagated by white capitalist media mm -hmm. in order to portray these two communities as being in tension with each other and particularly to portray this narrative of of black communities being unreasonable to the point of violence against right. korean merchants and biz businesses when in actuality these are both racialized communities the mm -hmm. difference is between the korean community and the black community is that that legacy of racialization and marginalization extends all the way back to migration patterns to back in south korea and that mm -hmm. connection is still there wow. as a direct result of empire and colonialism. And then you replicate it on a national level um, mm -hmm. throughout all of the major cities. And it, it creates a much more, co more coherent understanding mm -hmm. of the issues that we're all facing and the reasons for, for violence. And um, the narratives that we see are that, for example, in the San Francisco Bay Area, what you see in local media are when black people initiate these attacks, right? Mm -hmm. When you see anti-Asian violence on TV, more often than not, it's when black or Latino men it's a person of are, color. Right? Yeah, when it's a person of color. Yeah. But that's robbing it of its con of its context right. because ninety percent of Asian American hate crimes, violence, bullying, shunning, etc 
are initiated by white people. Yeah. So then, you know, that changes a lot of this narrative that we see in online spaces. Yeah, yeah. Of, of like, well, you know, when, when black people commit these crimes, it has a different backdrop right. than when the dude went in Georgia, went and right. shot up a nail salon, right. and then was essentially, you know, given a slap on the wrist and said mm -hmm. that he had a very bad day. Those are very different scenarios that are being painted as, oh, it's all anti-Asian violence. Oh, you mean the, 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 the massage parlor? Yeah. Right, right, right. That's what it was, right. So lastly, what do you think we can do as a minority society moving forward to improve our narrative? can do things like donate and mm -hmm. um, talk about uh, houselessness and advocacy and and all of these all of these things we can do them but they're often one-time um, actions but one thing which is very much what you're building Marcus is a political education cam campaign mm -hmm. where we're actually working to inform ourselves and when we inform ourselves of this knowledge of this history it helps build a consciousness and a framing for how we view problems moving forward mm -hmm. so that we can avoid the problems that led to, for example, the LA uprisings and you know, everything happened in light of Rodney King. Um, and we can work to end police violence on a street level so that it, and address anti-Asian violence and um, violence of, of all forms. All the various community organizations that are, you know, very much have been doing this work for decades, for generations, mm -hmm. um, centering their narratives, right? Mm -hmm. So, for example, on social media, very much paying attention to, okay, what are what are these organizers and activists saying, mm -hmm. right? Especially if they're from a community, which I would like to learn more about. Mm -hmm. How can I, how can I listen to and sort of empty my cup of truths that I know mm -hmm. and fill it with, with, with what their truths might be. In other words, how can I make sure that I'm not speaking for a community mm -hmm. and that I am speaking with a community and building a dialogue and engaging with these communities to ask the questions, okay, what are your community's needs? How can I stand alongside you as mm -hmm we build towards what your goals are as a community. And if we can do that across communities, inter-ethnic, transracial, solidarity, community building, mm -hmm. I think that's really the only way that we can address all these root causes of violence. It's also recognizing the difference in experiences. Sure, yeah. Because yeah. if we, like I, like I had mentioned, if we are speaking to, if we are speaking in these sort of romantic terms of like coming together and mm -hmm. unity, right? It could potentially wash over the very stark differences that do exist in our experiences, yeah. right? And it's only, yeah. only understanding and working to understand and learn what those differences are that we can truly build an intersectionality that has to be, has to be, how we ground our work of coalition building. Yeah, yeah. Well, brother, I just wanna thank you for being a part of this conversation, man. Like I told you before, man, I, I admire your passion towards civil and human rights and, and your creativity and, and just wanting to create awareness and, you know, and leading with love and positivity. So thank you again for being here today, sharing your time and, you know, your, your knowledge and your insight. Of um, course. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate of course, it. man. I, I appreciate you and, and, and all that you do, man. And hopefully when this is all done, man, we'll be able to share the stage again. You know what I'm saying? Mm hmm Yeah. Now, like I said before, this is my last video in the series. And my hope is to create awareness and spread truth about our common, complicated history here in America. Now, please share these videos and be a part of creating awareness in hopes that we can create a, a better and more tolerant country in the future from learning from our past. I just want to thank you guys for watching and please be safe. Please be good to one another and God bless.